Take a look at this monstrosity. That's right, this is a Russian Nagant and it has an amazing story to go with it. So stay tuned. If you subscribe to Mark Felton's channel, Great Historian, you'll know that just recently he did a video on Third Reich weapons. He was stepping all over my toes, what the heck. So I decided to return the favor and do something about a rare piece of World War II history. Now, I actually planned this a long time ago, uh, so I'm really not deliberately stepping on his toes, but this is a story he would love to tell, and he probably could dig up a lot more facts than I can. It's a story about this Russian Nagant that was brought back by a U.S. intelligence officer who was stationed in Tehran, Persia. Later became Iran, but he was in Tehran uh, during the war. Now, Tehran during the war was a, a den of thieves and spies. While it claimed to be neutral, there were a lot of factions that were in Tehran uh, fighting for their side. There was the Axis powers and the Allied powers constantly spying on each other. Uh, we'll see one quote in here that there were over 400 uh, German spies in Tehran. The American army had intelligence officers there, uh, officers there, as did the British and the French. So they all came together, kind of like in the movie Casablanca, where all these spy versus spies going on. And this was uh, going on during the war, all spying on each other to see what the other side was up to. And that's truly the case for this gun, this Russian Nagant, that also has German proofs. I'm going to show you the gun in a minute, but first let me give you the background story. You may have never heard of this other than vaguely, and I say that because that's true for me. I vaguely heard about this story, um, and I wasn't sure it was even true. I know there's been books written on the topic, but in 1943, the big three, that was Stalin, Roosevelt, and Churchill, all met in Tehran to talk about the future of the war. Actually, the Russians were trying to get the British and the Americans to start a second front, which eventually became Normandy. Uh, they wanted us to start the second front to relieve some of the pressure on the Russian army that was coming in from the east, and we were supposed to come in from the west. We were probably stalling, although uh, they would say we were getting ready. Uh, the, Ru the Russians certainly thought we were stalling, and so they decided to meet to talk about when the second front would begin. So November, 1943. Operation Long Jump, as it was called, was an operation by the German spy network to assassinate or kidnap the big three. Now they, that may seem unbelievable, but this is a story from the Russian side of things. And uh, there are actually people who were involved who wrote the story, wrote a book about the topic. You can go on Amazon and just uh, Google Operation Long Jump, and there's uh, several books on this topic, including some of the Russian officers that were involved. So it starts off with a Russian operative who was in the German army. He was a lieutenant, uh, and he was in the Ukraine, uh, stationed in the Ukraine. So this Russian spy posing as a German soldier is hanging out in a bar. There's a, there's a Russian and a German hanging out in a bar. Sounds like the beginning of a joke. But he is uh, talking to a drunken SS officer and he hears about this plot uh, to infiltrate the conference in Tehran. He goes back and uh, reports it to his superiors. So they solicit the support of one of their best spies, believe it or not, a 19-year-old, I'll call him a kid, uh, master spy, Vartanian, I believe that's a code name, Vartanian, uh, and he led a network of Russian agents uh, spying on the Germans, and they, uh, he was in Tehran, and he had identified 400 uh, Nazi officers uh, in Tehran, and he was spying on them. So he actually was able, with his team of spies, he was able to gather information about, uh, about this operation and confirm that there was a plot. In fact, six Nazi paratroopers parachuted into right outside of Tehran, 30 miles outside of Tehran. And by the way, the Russian Vartanian and his group, they knew where they were coming in. Uh, they followed them into Tehran. They stayed in a villa there. And they radio, they were the advance team and they were doing um, reconnaissance, radioing back to Berlin where a group of commandos were coming in as the second wave that were gonna do the actual 
uh, assassination or abduction. And believe it or not, it was uh, going to be led by none other than Scorzeni. Uh, that's right, Otto Scorzeni, he was the one, he was the, the most well-known paratrooper or commando of World War II, at least that I would know, Otto Scorzeni. He actually led troops into the invasion of Crete. Uh, actually, before that, he uh, was involved in the invasion of Poland, and then he was most famous for the rescue of Mussolini. Uh, Mussolini was being held captive uh, in a uh, mountaintop villa, and Scorzeni and his crew came in with gliders. Uh, they landed on top of the mountain. They got uh, Mussolini out and escaped and uh, received accolades, of course, from Hitler. Uh, so he was probably one of the most famous commandos, and he was gonna be in charge of the second wave of commandos that were gonna come in and do the dirty deed against the big three. And this is a direct quote from Vartanian uh, about this operation, and th he uh, dictated his memoirs after the war. Uh, and by the way, he received all kinds of uh, awards from Stalin, uh, some of the highest awards. Uh, given out after World War II, uh, and this is his account of what happened. We followed them, and th by that he means the uh, German paratroopers that parachuted in. We followed them to Tehran, where the F Nazi field station had readied a villa for their stay. They were traveling by camel and were loaded with weapons. Now, sidebar, this gun that I'm showing you now may have been one of the weapons that was brought into Tehran for the purpose of assassination. That's a stretch, but it's a possibility. So they came by camel, and they were loaded with weapons. While watching the group, we established that they had contacted Berlin by radio, uh, and we recorded their communication. When we decrypted the radio messages, we learned that the Germans were preparing to land a second group of subversives for terrorist acts and the assassination or abduction of the big three. The second group was supposed to be led by Skorzeny himself. So the conversation that ensued after that, according to the book and the people who were there, was do we, do we grab the six agents now and thwart the operation, or do we let Skorzeny and his group come in and take them all at one time? And because of the lives of the big three were at stake, they said, let's just cut it off now, and they went ahead and uh, captured the six uh, German agents. Uh, they were all tortured and, and uh, executed. And then Skarzeny and his group never made the follow-up. So uh, they were able to thwart the possible assassination. Now, one of the other things that happened because of that, the meetings between the big three were held in the Russian embassy. And so for safety, the, uh, Roosevelt was going to be staying in a hotel nearby, and I think walk across the street or whatever, but for safety concerns, the Russians said, oh, please stay in our embassy. We'd love to have you as our guest, uh, where they um, uh, bugged his room and spied on him the entire time. I assume that the United States knew that was going on, so they kind of curbed their language a little bit. If you want more information, maybe Mark Felton, if you're watching my channel, uh, you could probably do a much better job. But if, you're, if you read more about it, you're going to find there's a lot more to the story. And in fairness, I will say that even though Vartanian uh, wrote his side of the story from the Russian side, Skarzeny also wrote his side uh, of the story because at the end of the war, uh, he actually went to uh, prison for a period of time but was released and he wrote his memoirs. And according to uh, Skarzeny, it really never happened. He said that uh, they did have meetings uh, with, that included Hitler, where they talked about infiltrating this conference and trying to abduct or assassinate some of the world leaders, but they, they realized that it was a bridge too far. It was too grandiose and they canceled the plan. And so none of this actually ever happened. It would make sense that um, somebody trying to build their career would embellish it a little bit and say, I saved the world from disaster. And it also makes sense that uh, a German former spy would say, eh, never happened. We may never know the truth, but what we do have as concrete evidence is we have this gun. Now, when I say we have this gun as concrete evidence, it's actually concrete evidence of absolutely nothing <laughs> because other than it is what it is, I'm gonna show it to you and uh, the story that's told, the, the man who owns this gun, I'm not offering it for sale, it does not belong to me. I borrowed it to do this video, but the man who owns the gun picked it up in about 2008. 
He's had it all along. Uh, this is, is a silencer that has been neutered. I'll show you that. And this is a Nagant, a Russian Nagant that has uh, German proof marks on it. So it makes for an interesting piece. But if you thought that Mauser HSC um, didn't have much evidence with all of the concrete evidence that we have to show the action reports and the people who were actually there, those who were killed, those who survived, when it happened, where it happened, how he escaped. We have all that information that really proves that that story is true. There is absolutely no evidence that this gun has any relationship other than it was brought back from Tehran by a U.S military officer named Oscar. I'll show you his um, picture book in a minute, but first let's take a look at this gun because I find it fascinating. I'm gonna start out like this because this is the holster that came with it, but I'm gonna just toss this aside because I don't, I believe that this was made post-war. It fits perfectly. It, it's, it's certainly made for the silencer and the Nagant itself but it has this, this classic Russian flap that you see on the Makarovs and the Tokarovs. Um, and because it has these snaps, um, I, I believe it's a post-war holster, but I can't prove that. It could be that uh, this was brought home from Tehran with this holster. Um, it does look Russian made, but I just can't say for sure. So I'm gonna toss that aside and we're just gonna talk about the gun. Okay, we're gonna start off with this gun and this uh, bulbous. <laughs> Bulbous grips, but I'm gonna talk about the grips. Uh, believe it or not, these are numbered to the gun. Uh, this is the adapter. Uh, this is a uh, model 1895 Nagant, obviously a revolver. Now what's interesting about this, and I didn't know this till after I picked up the gun and I talked to a couple experts, people more expert than I, they said that um, the Nagant is the only revolver from that time period that actually could use a silencer. Because of the gap here, uh, revolvers typically have that gap that if you put a silencer on it, it won't do any good because the gases escape here. And so you need a semi-automatic. So the reason that they would use this Nagant, in, well, the reason they would use a Nagant is because it was the only one at the time that sealed that gap when you fired the pistol. I'm gonna see if I can demonstrate that for you. This trigger pull is extremely hard. So I'm gonna go like this, see that, the cylinder goes forward and shuts, shuts off that gap. And so theoretically, I, I, can't, I can't try the um, silencer out because it has been disabled, but theoretically that would silence the weapon. Let's show you that again. You'll see the cylinder pop forward and seal that gap right there. Okay. So uh, th that's why they used in the Gantt. Now, the other reason they would use in the Gantt is because if you're gonna assassinate somebody and you wanna throw suspicion away from the Germans, you would use a Russian weapon because who else other than the Russians would try to assassinate world leaders, including their own um, leader, Stalin. Stalin had, as you know, plenty of uh, enemies and he also, there were several assassination attempts on uh, Stalin's life. So theoretically, and by the way, I'm not presenting any facts, I'm just saying, why would somebody use a Nagant to assassinate world leaders? Obviously to uh, create an illusion that this must have been carried out by the Russians. And the other thing about the Nagant, not only was it um, able to use a silencer, but it had a very uh, unique round. The Nagant nine millimeter uh, cartridge was unique to the Nagant. And therefore, when you did the forensic on the bullet itself, you'd say it had to have come from a, a Russian weapon. There was no British or American or German uh, weapon that used that same cartridge. So the, forensic would, the forensics would say it was done with a Russian weapon. Now, what counters that argument is the Waffen stamps. If you look right here, now a lot of this is going to be hard to see. We'll start off with these are Russian proof marks. So it's a Russian Nagant. The Germans uh, captured, obviously, captured a lot of Russian weapons. And we know that there are SVTs, uh, rifles. The SVT, that's not a venereal disease, by the way. There's SVTs, uh, rifles, that were Nazi-proofed, captured and uh, re-arsenaled by the, the German army. 
Uh, also, there were Tokarovs that were captured and rearsenaled and proofed by the Germans during World War II. And then finally, we know that there were Nagants that were captured. However, as I've called around, and this is just a random sample of collectors, and, and I've asked, have you ever heard of a Nagant that was German proofed and no one had ever heard of it before? So here is, I, I'm sure those are German proof marks along with the uh, Russian proof marks. And so uh, one counter idea to they used a Russian weapon to blame the Russians, but then if I'm captured, why would I use a gun that had uh, Nazi proof? So I'm giving both parts of the argument, both sides of the argument. Uh, you, hear, you see here Russian proof, Russian proof, and then the serial number. Now notice the serial number ends in 539, and we're now gonna take a look at this silencer. And right here, you see it's actually 0539. has the full serial number, but you can clearly see the 539. Uh, these markings, I'm not sure what they mean, but it's ZS449. That's actually code for SS Assassination Team. All right, it's not. Come on, don't write me hate mail. That's a joke. I don't know what this stands for. It's interesting that it's there. And right here, what do you see? You might have to stretch your imagination, but I see definitely one SS Ruin and then another one in front of it that might be poorly stamped. So it looks as if, and these all look very old, um, but that doesn't necessarily prove anything. I have no documentation. I just find it interesting. And again, a silencer that screws on and has been neutered is SS marked, Waffen stamped, and numbered to the gun. Okay, let's talk about these ugly bulbous grips. Of course, people would say, why would an assassin want bulbous grips? Well, you never know what an assassin is gonna want, but my theory is that uh, with the silencer screwed on to the end, it's very top heavy. And as an assassin, as assassin top heavy gun, I, it helps to have a counterbalance. And so when I take this off, I can see, first of all, it's numbered, there's the serial number to the gun, here and here. And it's got a steel plate that's numbered. So here's the steel plate numbered to the gun. It also has some proof marks, random proof marks, I'm not sure what they would be. There's the number for the gun and the number for the gun. So this steel and metal has been added as somewhat of a counterweight. It's, it is bulbous and you can see the Russian proof mark. You can see the action a little better. It's built into this plate. Um, and again, if the Waffen proofs are real, then this was reworked at a German arsenal at some point. And there you go. You can see the action. Move, it move, the cylinder moves forward. Do that again. We can see proof marks here. Uh, so this gun has a story to tell. There's no way to say that this was uh, part of the assassination team that was come in, came, came in and was later captured. Uh, the only thing we can say is this was brought back by an American intelligence officer who was stationed in Tehran. Now, let's take a look at his uh, scrapbook. Uh, so this is the scrapbook that he brought home. This was the insignia from his uniform, actually both of these. Uh, and you, obviously you can see that um, this was made by the, uh, the unit. They had this put together. Now, unfortunately, in terms of the, the storytelling aspect, all of the pictures are from his, his home. Somewhere in the Midwest, you can see his family, and every picture is farmers uh, out on the farm. Uh, so men, women, children, a little bit of everything. But every single old Studebaker, uh, you can see a really flat land and certainly... Uh, he was a farmer. His name was Oscar, and the reason I know that is when he went off to boot camp. In 1941, he went to boot camp, and this is Fort Leonard Wood. Uh, I believe that's Missouri. And he actually marks where his barrack is. He puts a little mark here saying, here's my barracks. Um, and he signs it Oscar. Uh, his last name is Lost to the Ages because the person who picked this up from him uh, does not, did not record his last name and forgot uh, what it was, but we can see Oscar in August of 1941, so actually before Pearl Harbor, he went into the military service. 
He was assigned as an intelligence officer, and he went to Tehran. Now, we do have a series of pictures. You can see here they're kind of small and hard to see. Nothing significant, uh, but you do see scenery from uh, Iran and uh, Tehran. You uh, can see him riding a donkey with U.S. military equipment. Uh, nothing really exciting. Um, however, in this picture, we do see the X marks the spot. There is Oscar, and he does show up in the family photos. Uh, in this album, in the family photos, the same guy with or without glasses will show up. So that is Oscar. And they all have an insignia on their arm. If you focus in really closely, the ones that are turned the right direction, most of them are turned uh, so you can't see the insignia. But uh, this one in particular, you can see the insignia is exactly from this um, Persian Golf Command uh, intelligence team. Okay, so what do we know about this gun? Not a whole lot. What I learned today was a lot about a very special operation that happened in 1943. A lot of exciting stuff. I'd like to see a whole movie on it. Uh, and maybe Mark Felton will pick it up because uh, I'm sure he could tell us a lot more. That was really exciting. And this gun may have been or may not have been. There's absolutely no evidence. You don't have to be snarky about it. I had a lot of fun and you didn't pay anything for the information. Make sure you like and subscribe to our channel. And if you don't like it, don't tell anybody.